recording in progress. It's recording. All right, so um, everyone, this is Andreas from AO Performance, and I am currently in Washington, DC. Been here for a little over a week, You're working with Nick Backstrom, Washington Capitals, and a couple of other players. And today I have the most honor to introduce, I think it's actually 10 years this year, Lenny, that uh, we actually, wow. yeah, because I did gift in 2012. So uh, pretty much almost to the day, 10 years ago, that we first met. So anyway, so I have uh, Lenny Persino from Los Angeles, California with me. And I think if I look at all the therapists and trainers and, and uh, people I met in the business, I think Lenny is definitely one of the most knowledgeable guys I ever met. Uh, he knows a lot about a lot. And you're going to hear this in this episode. Uh, he's been a real huge inspiration to me, especially when it comes to um, yeah, fascia treatment and, I mean, overall movement, 3D movements, um, and, and also to be a really good guy, because Lenny is a really, really good guy, and uh, <laughs> that's maybe the most important part, but um, you know, <laughs> we know a lot, too. Um, so uh, since I met you 10 years ago for the first time, I really like you, like, uh, on the spot, uh, first time and when you start talking i'm like wow this guy knows a lot and also you have um uh, when you understand that when someone can explain complex stuff in a simple matter i think that that's when you really understand something i was it einstein who said that i think or some someone right oh, um man. yeah and I, I i know that you're really good at that and hopefully today we're gonna um, first absolutely get to know you Lenny better for the Swedish audience and um, then we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the way you and I see the body in, in movement therapy in, in treatment therapy and I know you have something that that you've been working on as well that I really want to hear more about and if you want to share that uh, that would be amazing but first of all like um, who are you what do you do Lenny tell me where <laughs> you're born <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm originally from the East Coast. Um, oh, really? Real close, yeah, real close to where you're at right now, Connecticut. Uh -huh. uh, 30 years ago, I came out to California, mainly because like of a lot of other people, the weather, it's just absolutely amazing. I always love being outdoors, uh, love playing sports. And the hindrance of the weather back East just got to me. And I finally said, let's go. And um, yeah. you ever have the chance to go from San Francisco to San Diego down the coast? Uh, it's one of the most memorable trips I've ever taken. And I've been all over the world. Uh, it's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. And I said, hey, you only live once. So I got out to California and been here ever since. Yeah. Oh, wow. Do you surf? Yes, I do. Um, in fact, we might go today. Uh, right. <laughs> Are you good? No, <laughs> I try. What? it's not about, it's really not about being good. Although I, okay. I strive to become better each time. Uh, it's just getting out in the element and feet in the sand and getting into the ocean. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah and you know, uh, it's amazing when you see it on, on TV. Oh, I was Never watching it. Event this morning. Yeah. Yeah. There's some great surfers around here too. It's, uh, I can imagine. it's a lot of fun to watch. You, you, can, you can teach me next time I come and visit you. We can you can teach me some, some yes. moves. moves. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up in, in the like the movement industry? You know, I always had a love for anatomy. I've always had a love for human movement. Even if I didn't play the sport or understand much about the sport, at an early age, movement always sucked me in. Um, yeah. and I had somebody say this to me a long time ago, if you define love as a unity, take your time and draw out all the things that you love. And, you know, it, it could take some time, like it could be trees, it could be the ocean movement, yeah. whatever it is. And then you ask yourself a critical question. How much time do you spend doing that? So the lesson here is, if you do things you love to do, 
you're going to be great at it, number one, and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. And I knew that early on. I was lucky. I knew that early on. It's something I'm trying to pass off to my kids because I see a lot of kids, they go to school, they get into careers they don't really love. Yeah. And so I can't tell you how many times I've been on an airplane and I open up a, a textbook and everyone's like, what are you studying for? What class are you studying for? And I'm like, no, this is my leisure reading. You know, this is just what I love to do. Yeah. And so that's, that's really, it's just, it's in me, you know, I, and I'm not an exercise holic either. Like I don't exercise like crazy. Yeah. Um, I move, you know, but uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not so about it. But you're in great shape. I know that. Oh, thank you. I think a lot of it's genetics, but you know, I, <laughs> my wife, my wife is an amazing cook. I mean, that's, that's so oh, much. That, yeah. Mean, it's so much. I guess you know from from the first time I met you, you, you like one big thing you talked about back then too was like um, like diets and nutrition and eating clean food and stuff. So are you still into that, or has it changed over the years? No, one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean it's tougher being in the NBA because we travel so much, and even though yeah. even though we eat, you know, we stay at really good hotels and uh, gourmet food and all that, it's not as good as home cooked. Um, you know, the type of oils we use and the food, yeah. we know where the fish is coming from. We know where the meat comes from. Yeah. Um, so travel makes it tougher. Um, but the answer is yes. We're always staying on top of it. You know, arguably, it's, it's one of the most important aspects of health. I mean, if you yeah. look at the amount of type 2 diabetes, I mean, <laughs> it, it's crazy. When I was a kid, you'd go to school and maybe one or two kids had a metabolic disease and they were overweight. Yeah. Now you go to a school, <laughs> even kids yeah. on the team, the kids that are moving a lot, you yeah. see, you know, the obesity, unfortunately, Absolutely. you know, and so much, what people don't understand is so much of this has to do with your collagenous makeup and how resilient your body is. Yeah. Um, and directly. So if, if you like, uh, we have a Swedish, Swedish audience. So if you go back to that word, the collagenous Oh, yeah. Think, yeah. So it's about collagen. That's a great question. Yeah. Think yeah. of collagen as. So what is collagen? Go back to that. Right? It's a protein. Eh? Yeah, it's the most abundant protein in the body. Yeah. So the most common um, protein in the body. Yeah. Collagen to a human is what cellulose is to a plant. Mm. It forms the structure. Yeah. So if you took everything out of your body and you only left the collagen, we could see you. Yeah. And in another word, what we are talking about, and we, and if I'm talking about myself and, and what we do is we talk about fascia a lot. So that word mm -hmm. fascia comes from, so the collagen fibers really are one structure that is collagen and really what makes us strong. So we're going to get deeper into that later on. Uh, you mentioned uh, NBA, and that's, of course, pretty cool. Um, you know, I've been working with uh, NHL. Uh, I'm a more hockey guy uh, for many, many, many years. And uh, so one thing I think is pretty cool that I am in NHL. I've been working because of my results. So I actually talked to one of the uh, one of the owners of, of uh, on an NHL club yesterday, and I said like it's pretty interesting that NHL players from so many teams for so many years has been flying me from Sweden to North America to help them, mainly with injuries. Uh, when it's in season uh, and then of course performance training during off season but during season they have injuries they know maybe I can help them a little bit faster than, than other, other uh, therapists and I think that's interesting why is that and of, I mean I know it works and I know the results I've had over the years and obviously because you're doing pretty much the same as I do and you ended up in the NBA I mean the basketball league in, in the U.S which is, of course, even a bigger thing because the NBA is a lot bigger than NHL. Um, why do you think that, first of all, what's going on in the NHL? Why, why do they have to fly me in from Sweden when they have like, they should have better therapists and trainers and stuff in the NHL, I think. Or are they still like thinking uh, like the traditional way of thinking, training and movement and therapy? Is it just you and I that do something different or 
how if you look at the business for my first question is how did you end up in the nba and number two is what are you and i doing different apart from, from others yeah there's a lot of ways of answering this because i've reeled this one in my head many times um number one to answer your question results yeah um i get asked all the time how did you get into the nba how are you able to work with you know <laughs> arguably you know the top athletes in the world. Um, yeah. And it all comes down to results. And the one thing that I learned is, listen, I'm older. Um, I'm working with athletes that are 19 to 32, 33 years of age. You know, we grew up in a different era. Um, the NBA is largely African American. We don't have the same friends. We just don't, we don't listen to the same music. So the thing that I realized early on, and I try to express this to younger kids coming in, is you're there to do a job. You're not there to be their best friend. Yeah. And there's times where, whether it's a treatment or you're in the training conditioning room, I mean, these guys are under a lot of stress contractually, you know, around trade deadline. They take yeah. this very serious. You need to take the job very serious. And I oftentimes, a pet peeve of mine, see practitioners getting into these roles at the highest level, and they get real, uh, like overconfident, like I made it. Yeah. And they don't strive to be better. Yeah. I've seen that over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, I just think that attitude is only going to get you so far. And that's where these athletes that are very serious once they recognize another professional is working on their mastery like they are working on their mastery their craft it becomes yeah. a relationship True. and you know if i have a player for example that's not real serious personally uh, you know i don't i don't work with those types of players i work with the very serious and you know i've been lucky because I really haven't met. There's been a couple. They're not on our team anymore. There's been a couple that, that you know, whatever. They're just what I call uh, genetic ballers. They don't put a lot of time and effort into the craft. They just, yeah. you know, genetically gifted. And that will get you so far. Um, but yeah. The people that work really hard at their craft. And so I think, you know, great recognizes great, you know, and if, if you're really working on becoming better. And I think the two things that I look for are humility and adaptability, yeah, right? Probably. To sit here and think that we know a lot and we're so much better than everyone else, that, that's ridiculous. And I have seen that. I've seen practitioners come in and just think they, they know so much. Um, and that's really frustrating. Another way of looking at this, and if these words are too technical, just stop me, but Sure. When you go to school to become a physical therapist, you are going to school to understand pathology, which is a state of disease. Yeah. And you get really good because in our programs out here, there are DPT programs, doctor of physical therapy. So there's a lot yeah. of school, but you become yeah. great at pathology. Yeah. And you are great at helping the surgeon, you know, with their procedures, whether it be pre post procedure. You cannot tell me, and I've taught enough around the United States and different PT schools and, and clinics to see a variety of physical therapists in their education. You can't tell me that in a DPT program, you're learning about functioning of an athlete. No, you have to do that outside of school. Yeah. So the great ones, if you really look at their educational journey, they learn so much outside of school so now you have management management hires a team management says i need an athletic trainer and an atc they too do not learn that mm -hmm. high level functioning no. um never mind manual therapy i mean <laughs> you're lucky to get 20 to 30 hours of manual therapy in a doctor yeah. program yeah right so yeah. that's why you know we often see when we teach our classes a lot of what i call pressing and praying you know mm -hmm. We don't know what we're touching and we're not taught. It's no one's fault. It's just, this is the cricket. So again, yep. upper management looks at hiring athletic trainers, 
strength and conditioning coaches, physical therapists. Sometimes they'll bring a chiropractor in. The yeah. models of education oftentimes don't match what the athlete needs. That doesn't mean there's not pertinent information there. I'm not downplaying the education, but when it comes to the practical aspect of what I need to know as a practitioner to help facilitate an athlete's career, it's not taught in school. No, no, it is not. In school, everyone knows this, regardless of the field that you specialize in, Yeah, the academic institutions are way behind current research way behind some people say it could be 15 to 20 years before well-documented literature gets into the curriculum yeah so that that's a big one the other the other way this is just big open-ended question yeah <laughs> is we have we have the best athletes in the world um at my private practice the meyer institute of sport we're actually um below the la kings so we get to see the hockey players too my full-time job is in the NBA, but I also have a private practice that I will work when I'm not traveling and we will see, you know, the hockey players. Yeah. So the point is we're seeing the best in the world. Oftentimes you see people getting hired right out of school. You see youth being hired. Yeah. So I want you to think of this, these levels of where you are right now, where I am. Okay, we start off with information. We go to school, we take classes, we, we gather this information. Yeah. That information turns into a second level called a skill set. Yeah. So now we have a skill. The third level of education is experience. How much experience do you actually have coming right out of school or when you're 25? I want you to think about yourself. Yeah, nothing. You don't have a lot of experience. And what I say to people is, the most valuable thing you can do as a practitioner is get experience in all populations. Yeah. I've seen people in the NBA that I said, if they went into private practice, they'd be out of private practice because mm -hmm. they're used to working with big, resilient guys. How do you apply your skill set now to an 80 year old? Yeah. Right. The fourth level of education where you and I, right, but we still have the humility and adaptability is judgment. Yeah. At 54 years of age, I now I'm starting to have judgments because yeah. I've had so much experience, right? And I've gone through a lot of different skill sets because of the amount of information yeah. I've obtained. So yeah. again, information, skills, experience, and then judgment. You can't tell me at 25, even, even 30 years of age, you yeah. have a lot of judgment. And that's what I look for. And that's why I said humility and adaptability, because I have someone coming in, they're 32 years of age, and they just, oh, I know why your back is out. I know it's L4, L5. You know, it yeah. it, it's like, what book did you memorize? You know, a good one is I'm yeah. going to release the psoas. Have yeah. you ever taken a look in a cadaver? You can't touch a psoas. Yeah. It's, utter, it's utter bull. Yeah. But it's not their fault. What happens is we memorize. It's all about memorizing the textbook. Yeah. And, and that's where the mind construct comes from. You know, so, and that's where I, I came up with a system that talks about, okay, what are the scientific realities? Like, what can I anchor to so that I'm truthful, right? Yeah. And, and that's how this whole thing evolved with me is, yeah, that, that makes sense. Someone taught me this. It's like, look at a cadaver. Let's cut it layer by layer. Yeah. And you're like, wow, I used to think I was touching a psoas for a psoas yeah. release. Or how about yeah. this one? This is a great one. My hamstrings are tight. Yeah. Well, what is tightness? Yeah. Tightness is a sensation, yeah. right? So I'm like, you, you ask me, Lenny, do you love your wife? I love her dearly. And then you go, well, how do you prove it? Love is a sensation. Mm -hmm. How do I prove it? Yeah. Well, what am I going to say? I'm going to jump in front of her car for, her? you know, I mean, it, <laughs> it's like, yeah. So you have a sensation and geographically, we know where it is because you said hamstring. So naming yeah. muscles is just good for geography. It's not really yeah. the reality. Yeah, so it, it, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. And well, what do you say about these? Because I mean, you and I have been doing these for a long time. I mean, we've been believing in pretty much the same thing over a long period of time. Uh, I mean, talking about being, being 
I mean, the humility and um, I mean, always wanting to learn more. And I remember Gary Gray saying one time that he knows about like 5% of the human body's biomechanics when, and he knows a lot. And, and yeah. he said he knows about 5%. And I remember thinking back then when the first time I met him and I heard him say that, I'm like, okay, if he knows 5%, it means I know 0.00004, <laughs> you know, at the time. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's, just, but it, it taught me to be really, really humble to how complex our bodies are. Mm -hmm. And, but I mean, back, let's back up like, I don't know, 10 years, 12 to 15 years, when the, the word fascia came to like the movement industry and it was kind of ridiculed and destroyed by the critics and the scientists. And it's, it's and then like 2018, I, I think it was like named the, the biggest organ in the body for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, or it was 17 or 18, I remember about it. And, but still today, I mean, we have a lot of critics that says there's no science behind this. There's no literature. There's nothing. This is BS, uh, yeah. which makes me like, I know there's a lot. So what are they missing? Or don't they want to read these news uh, papers about this? Or what do you think? What's, what, what's the issue? Because we know it's one, it works. Uh, you said it yourself. We, you and I get hired to the NBA, NHL, and the best athletes in the world because of our results. Nothing else. Not not because yeah, we're nice. Results. Like yeah. It's only results. Because these guys want to be even better. And uh, so why do you think that is? That this critic and, and like we talk about the reductionist way of thinking, um, right? Yeah. It's still so like worn into to people that they don't want to change. And I know people don't want to change. It's hard to change. But uh, there, there are a lot of science what, about what we do. But maybe we need to wait another 10, 15, 20 years because to get even more. But I think yeah. it is, it's enough now, right? Uh, what do you say about this? Oh, there's a tremendous amount of research. Um, you know, every year they have a big connective tissue conference. <laughs> um, they're starting to bring in, you know, experts from all walks and everybody is in agreement you know this is yeah. something that we neglected in anatomy mainly because it's very hard to discern uh the start and finish so yeah what i will say is because i listen to all the critics because you can learn a lot listening to critics 100 percent, me too and what i will say is there's a lot of false claims that are made yeah and i think you know that's where the critics really get loud um very few people really understand what is changeable um yeah and you know it's just again it's a lack of being exposed to it it's definitely not taught uh as a in-depth curriculum and I, I think that's how i would answer it um yeah it's, you know, again, there's a lot of false claims. You, you can't stretch dense connective tissue. To stretch it is to tear it. Yeah. Um, but what rarely, if, if your listeners sift through with this lens, you'll be able to see what's right and what's not. And that is people have to explain the difference between dense connective tissue and loose connective tissue yeah loose connective tissue is changeable it changes all the time all the time in fact a great example i give clients is say your back is stiff in the morning you wake up and you're like wow my back is really stiff all you have to do is go into the shower and put hot water on it for four or five minutes and 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to get out and feel much better. That is because the loose connective tissue changed its viscosity. Yeah. Okay. So like if you have ketchup in the refrigerator and you let it sit in the back and then you go, oh, wow, I can't get it out of the bottle. When you pull it out of the refrigerator, all you have to do is run it under hot water. It becomes less viscous and now it comes out. Well, our body is predominantly made of fluid. That's one of the scientific realities that I anchor to. And that's what we share in our program is the living. I'm going to emphasize this. The living human body is mainly fluid. So when you give me research 
in a laboratory of a tendon or a piece of connective tissue that's been pulled out of the living, you completely change the metrics. Yep. You realize that most of the Achilles tendon, most of the Achilles tendon is fluid. Yeah. Now they've done studies on the living where they'll do an MRI of the Achilles tendon before a long run and then after. And what you see is a reduction in the fluid content, yeah. which increases, by the way, the stress. Because one yeah. of the things that water does in the body is it mutes stress. Yeah. <laughs> so when you have a runner, for example, and they're having issues like their calf cramped or they have a, you know, a micro tear, whatever it is, yeah. the fluid concentration is a critical component. So I'm going to simplify this and it's interesting because this is accurate and true, but I'm not downplaying the skill set. When you put your hands on someone and I put my hands on someone, we're like plumbers. Yeah. There's two things that you can change. You can change the sensorial aspect. In other words, you, you can yeah. help the sensitivity. Yeah. Okay. So the nervous system and yeah. you can change the fluids. Yeah. But you can't take a human hand and manipulate the collagen and change its morphology in one session. That's like me saying, I want biceps like you rub my bicep and, and yeah. all of a sudden I've got a big bicep. Yeah. You can't do that. No, makes so no sense. that's where the false claims come into play. And a lot of people are doing things and, you know, rightly so they're called out. You know, I, yeah. I see it all the time. But do you think that like, so if we're talking about runners or elite sports and they got a lot of density in their tissues, like, but it has to be the same with inactivity, right? Yes. So yeah. let's, I mean, we have a, uh, I know if you heard about it, but in, in Sweden, we have a new sport called paddle, paddle, maybe in English. Uh, it's kind of, if you mix like tennis and squash, oh. Oh. Um, it's, it's, it's exploding. I mean, everybody's playing it and everybody's getting injured because people that haven't, it's, it's, it's a, lot easy, a lot easier yeah. to learn than tennis. Right. Uh, so everybody can play it. Yeah. Um, and but then again, then we have these like 30, 40, 50 year old, especially guys that uh, right. haven't moved for 20 years and all of a sudden want to play this sport. Mm -hmm. And then there goes the Achilles tendon and they want to like, oh, what happened? Right. And that, right. that probably because of the inactivity before um, that causes that instead of doing too much, I guess. So it's kind of the same thing, right? If you do too little and you do too much, it's going to create right. the same reaction, right? In the fluid. Yeah, one of our scientific realities is load is essential, right? Loading, but it's the Goldilocks effect, right? You can't have too much load because an injury, by definition, a disruption of unity is when load exceeds the tissue's capacity. Yeah. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, as you perfectly put, if you're not loading the body, then you're not adept at handling the demands. Yeah. So the and we're seeing a lot of this now because of covid and a lot of people were very inactive yep. even if they're active people especially where i live people are very active because of the weather you know promotes yeah. getting outdoors and, and moving around but people are not going into work they're not going up and down the stairs in and out of the car yep. and they're sitting at home and they're sitting at their desk and like you said then they want to go out and they're demanding that their connective tissue recoils. So this is what gets interesting. When you yeah. go to the gym and you do what we call isotonic loading. So, you know, say a, you know, press or however you do it, yeah. you're activating the muscles and they're under constant tension and there's, you know, positive adaptations to that, but that's very different than the sport that you just talked about. Yeah. Where it requires not so much activity from the muscle, in a constant flow, it requires the muscle to get the system going, but then the body recoils through yeah. the white tissue. So this is accurate and it's going to sound oversimplified, but it's accurate. Think yeah. of the body as red tissue, which is muscle mm -hmm. and white tissue, mm -hmm. which is connective tissue. Yeah. And you start to look at these sports and you say to yourself, well, if I'm going in the gym and I'm just training my red tissue, Mm -hmm. Now, obviously everything's being trained, but an yeah. emphasis, if you will, Got it. Um, how am I training the elasticity of the white tissue? And that's, what's been changing 
um, and people are coming on board with this. Uh, I see it in the NBA. There's there's quite a few teams that are starting to understand the importance of the white tissue because we've been training the red tissue for years and years and years and years and years. Yep. Right. And you still do that, but you have to train the white tissue. And that's that's different. Uh, we call that an elastic recoil. Yeah. Um, where this, for, for those of you that want to understand this, it started with looking at animals. So when they look at an antelope or a kangaroo, they go, you know what? Their muscles are not that big. No. Like humans, but they're way more powerful, way stronger, <laughs> yeah. way yeah. more explosive. Imagine if we were that explosive as a human, right? Wow. Yeah. And they're like, wait a minute, there's got to be something to this. And sure yeah. enough, they got into the functionality of the fascia, the connective tissue and how energy comes into the body and how that energy then transmits. Um, and the thing with aging, for example, especially in my age, you have to be, you know, really careful um, if you're not creating like bouncy effects in the Achilles tendon, uh, yeah. it should be all areas of the body. Yeah. If I show yeah. people like what I do with my back, they think I'm crazy. Um, yeah. but I have an extremely healthy back because I train the elasticity. Yeah. Yeah. And I athletes think do it naturally now, mind you. So athletes do it naturally. And in their sport, you have to be elastic, right? If yeah, you, you look to. too muscly out on the ice or on the court, you look like, yeah. uh, you know, a mechanistic robot. Like yeah. you know, that's what happens. And that's what happens with the team. You start to see it. So those that are flowing and, you know, it's a beautiful synchrony of movement. You yeah. take all these segments and you put it together in synchrony. It's because we're transmitting energy efficiently. Yeah. And I think so that's why like sliding back to how we, you and I mix both like fascia treatments uh, or manual therapy with training a lot of it has to do like with the fluids obviously and to get people more elastic because since i started talking about this in in sweden and in social media or, or and stuff like this uh people have been trying starting to do it and i know myself like when i started to do a lot more elastic work like i don't know 10 years ago my body today had never felt better in movement right i, I mean i moved better today than i was when i did when i was 18. Yeah, me too. And when I was 18, I was really, really strong in, in that red tissue you're talking about. Um, I mean, really strong. In the gym, I was super strong. Mm -hmm. But today, I move better. Right. And, and I'm taking care of my, my white tissue a lot more. And I'm thinking about that, both when it comes to, like, of course, movement, but also like the, like the pre-movement or the warm-up or, or, you know, taking care of, I know you, you, you use the word like tissue hygiene. Like if you brush yeah. your teeth every day, why don't you take care of your tissues every day? And I do that. I mean, the first thing I do in the morning is I have um, different kind of balls under my kitchen table. So I roll my feet. The first thing I do when, I, when I'm having my coffee in the morning, that's the first thing I do. Yeah. So I give my feet some love um, from the moment I wake up. Yeah. And I think, I think this is a huge thing for the future of, 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 I mean, movement therapy overall, like both for when it comes to, to treat hands-on treatment, manual therapy and training that we need to focus on this white tissue that you're talking about. Um, so what happens, like if you see the white or you see the body as a, you put on a suit, like you, you I mean, let's say you, you, you're like us, you're working with like, you have like comfortable clothes, clothing every time you work. It's not very often we we show up in a suit, right? We like, really right. dress up, but when we do, we can barely walk, right? Because <laughs> we right. feel so stiff in, in, in this suit, right? Yeah. Um, so what happens if you put it on? A, let's say I'm a size, I don't know, fifty two, but I build up this red tissue, uh, so the white tissue gets too tight. So I put on like I'm I'm you know what I'm getting at, right? So I'm I'm a, I'm putting on a size forty eight, but I'm a size fifty two. Right. How yep. if I if I move bad in size 52 because I'm not used to move like that, how much worse will I move if I put on a suit that has size 48? It's well, I'll tell you, there's there's actually a scientific term for this. And uh, very few people. Um, practitioners I've met, they don't understand this. Uh, it, it is in the literature. In fact, it's uh, the functional atlas of the human fascial system. They have a whole section on it. It's called exertional yep. compartment syndrome. So what that means simply, and that's different than 
compartment syndrome when you have a crush injury, which can yep. be catastrophic. A lot of times they have to take a limb if it's, you know, an injury in the, the periphery. Um, this is when you build your muscles and there's basically a lack of space for the neurovascular channel. Yeah. And what that usually does is it creates irritation. And a lot of people get confused with the difference between injury, which is a true disruption of unity and an irritation. Like, yeah. oh, my back is achy yeah. or my calves are achy. So we see that. And I have a unique opportunity to work with a professional bodybuilder. He's like top three, Mr. Olympia. And, oh, wow. you know, had a, yeah. I mean, you talk about muscles on top of muscles on top of muscles, right? <laughs> yeah. He's always dealing with it, right? This is achy, this is achy, and that's achy. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's a new paper that just came out on delayed onset muscle soreness. And it's brand yeah. new. It came out maybe three months ago. They've now identified what it actually is. Yeah. And, you know, we never really knew what it was. So talk about science, you know, the literature allowing us to learn more and more. I mean, all these years we heard of DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. This is what it was yeah. doing. And now they're like, no, that's not what it's doing. Basically what it is, is there's still micro fibular sure. tears yeah. because of the stress you put through your body. It has nothing to do with the lactic acid as to why you sore. It has to do simply with there's more fluid pressure. There's more fluid pressure and that signals the sensory neurons. And interestingly, I always say this to people, I go, anytime you're in pain or you have an irritation, you fidget. Think about that. Yeah. Nobody, very rarely is a person going to sit there and go, mm. yeah, I'm in pain. No. I'm in pain. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell they're like, oh, this, yeah. that. And what that does, it actually change pressure gradients. That's what it does. It changes the pressure gradient in the body. Yeah, it's it's quite really fascinating. fascinating. That's why we fidget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at look at the animals too. Uh, if they hurt one leg, they're gonna jump around on that leg as well, even though it, they're hurting, but they're still gonna move on it because they have no choice, right? And they heal a lot faster. Well, we're so equipped with a protection mechanism. And yeah. and that's the sad part is when people they start using supplemental um, elements like NSAIDs and other drugs to mute the authenticity, yeah. right? And, and yeah. that's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, that's we a don't do a lot of people don't realize when we have, whether it be an ankle sprain or whatever, the first three days, we don't do any drugs. No, no drugs. You no. let we do natural natural things to pump the vascular system, which is mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we have a whole bunch of things that we do. And then if we think we need supplemental help, because the person is not getting uh, to where we think they should be day four, five, six, whatever it is, then then we'll, yeah. then we'll go in and, you know, we have yeah. experts that, that deal with that. Um, but the average person, what do they do? They immobilize, they ice, and they take yeah. NSAID. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because then they end up in our private practice, you know, six months later, a year later, still dealing with ankle soreness from an ankle sprain, you know, a year uh, later, uh, sometimes even with fluid. So, yeah, I got it. When I do uh, like with my, um, I got I got two different fascia treatment courses and um, this is level one and level two. And I, the first one I, I teach um, what to do in an acute ankle sprain and like, when, when, when the students go, go back home then and try this, they are like, wow, this is actually works. Just no one believes it at first. And I'm like, I've done it a million times. It works. And they're like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm, I'm going to put a uh, load on it as, as soon as I can. Mm -hmm. So I usually, um, what I teach is like, we load it in, in an ice uh, or a water bucket with ice in, if, yeah. if possible. Mm -hmm. So try to move in that. And let's say you, you, you sprain your, your right ankle. So you put like 95, depends how bad it is, but let's yeah. say it's pretty bad, but you load like 5% on the right one and you load 95% on the left one. And then you go from there. Then it's, you know, 94, six, 93, seven, 90, 10, right. And then you, you leave the bucket with it, with ice water, and then you do it on, on ground without water. So you get some, you let the, the heat um, from the body take care mm -hmm. of creating fluids, as you said, with the shower, same thing, right. And then yep. it comes back again to, to the bucket again, and we do it all over again. 
and I like most ankle sprains, they're back to, I mean, they can feel it, but they can do like it. They can jump, they can hop, they can do whatever after two, three days. And no one believes this. And yeah. like, try it and you'll see. Instead of, as you said, like go back home, you raise your leg up high and you take pills and you ice it and, you know, you take away all the fluids. Right. Yeah. So is that something, I guess you see a lot of anchor sprains in your, in, in NBA too. Is this something you do too? Is it, well, you agree with me? Yeah. Yeah. You know, 100%. Is, yeah. The, the first thing I, you know, I have great opportunity to work with some very intelligent people. Um, Dr. John Meyer, he's the one that kind of runs our department. And I've always been impressed with his, his clinical skill set. And um, I remember one time somebody had a bad ankle sprain, they came in and there's a lot of stress at the professional level. And yeah. immediately a management coming in the back to the treatment room, they want to know what's going on with their star player. Yeah, and I thought it was brilliant. John's like, I want you to just get out of the treatment room, and go for a walk just go. Yeah. And I'm like, everyone's like, what the heck is he doing? And I'm like, this kid's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Because what he's basically doing is he's trying to understand the authenticity of the injury. He's trying to see how protected yeah. uh, this person's nervous system is relative to the situation. And the situation now is multifactorial. You know, there's a structural component to it, sprain the ankle, but then you're off the court, you're in the back, we got a game still going on, we have playoffs coming up, you have management coming back, you have contracts, yeah. you know, there's a lot going on. Oh, and yeah, totally. So yeah, our ultimate is a long way of saying, what we have to do immediately is look at the load bearing capacity, right? Because one of the scientific realities, truths, is load is essential for healing. Exactly. Load is essential for healing. And there's been enough studies with astronauts where they're in tip top shape. They go up yeah. in space long enough, they come back withered away <laughs> Even on a great strength program, which they have. We work with, yeah. uh, we're, we're right next to SpaceX. So we actually get to talk with these scientists. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, so the load bearing capacity, we want to stimulate, but not aggravate. Yeah. So once you find the right dosage of load, you're better off doing it three or four times a day and giving it adequate rest in between yeah. sessions than just doing it once or too much Absolutely. And, and then doing nothing for the rest of the day. So yeah. uh, incremental loading, once you find the capacity and things like the ice, which is a contrast because you're going to have your own natural inflammatory yeah. heating phase, right? Yeah. Um, that creates a vascular pump. That's all that is. And we use things yeah. like Norma tech. Um, we'll do active motion, non weight bearing throughout yeah. the day. So it's not just do this three times a day in between. Yeah. These are the things you're going to do as well. Yeah. Um, you, you, so you pretty much constantly put load on it and movement on it. Right. Yeah. And then, and we test it, you know, test it every which way. Um, that's the one thing in pro sports is you have to really check all the boxes because if you put a player, I don't know how it is in the NHL, because uh, I'll see NHL players in private practice, but I'm not in the team setting. Gotcha. Whereas yeah. in the NBA, I'm in the team setting. Yeah. And you put a player out too early and they re-injure themselves, you, that's your job. Of that's course. your job. So Absolutely. we have to make sure all boxes are checked. For our athletes, all of them will have ultrasound, MRI. They'll first do an x-ray because it's right at the stadium. Yeah. The MRI is outside the stadium, so that'll take, you know, a day to get done. Um, yeah. So most often they're going to do the scans just to make sure. Because if you had a fracture, for example, you thought it was an ankle sprain, but you had an ankle sprain with a fracture, you put yeah. the player out too soon. Um, you know, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. And, and that's obviously the tough part, too. So you need to you check your boxes so you know that he or she is ready to, to, to go again right so because you want you don't want to lose your job right <laughs> no no so yeah that's that's one thing and that's why we have yeah. multiple practitioners too you know yeah. it's always a team. Especially, yeah yeah one thing is your job but you especially not want to hurt the, your athletes uh, at any level but um going back to because uh, i did a, a 
just just talking a little bit more about it because I think this is so interesting. I I had a 19 year old hockey player last spring and summer who he completely ruptured his uh, Achilles tendon and did surgery. I think it was like April 28th or something like this. And uh, I promised to do his rehab and I promised to put my heart and every, my knowledge into him because he really wanted to come back as soon as possible. Um, two and a half months later, he was starting to do some short sprints. Three months later, he was pretty much back to 100%. We did it, um, ultrasound on him and his Achilles tendons was like 99% as strong as the other one after mm -hmm. just three months. And we started to load him pretty much day two mm -hmm. after surgery. And, but he followed protocol. He did everything. He was walking in, in barefoot in the grass at home um, among the trees. We were doing that. We were doing the, just the sunlight, get some sunlight every day for him and walk with shoes, without shoes. Um, he was doing everything perfect. So he was like kind of the perfect client to have as well. But the interesting thing is we, we loaded him from the, I think it was day two after surgery. He was not allowed to sweat for like 10 days. Uh, after 10 days, when we were allowed to sweat, we started sweating too, because we did a lot of upper body work uh, yeah. and a lot of movement because he had a boot on so we could do that, right? Yeah. But the, uh, I mean, the people that were training around us and saw the, the progression he had from surgery till like sprint and, and he didn't miss one day in his, in his hockey team in his season. And to add to that, this is, I think, the coolest part. When he did testing in his team, he was stronger, he was faster, he had be better conditioning than ever. Yeah. So after doing rehab during the whole summer, during the whole off-season, mm -hmm. not only did we fix his Achilles tendon, he got faster, he got stronger, which for me is and more than enough proof that what we do actually works really well with the, with the loading we're talking about everything right. from the collagen fibers, getting those strong in movement variable kind of training. Right. And thinking about more like, okay, you can't move the Achilles tendon. No, you can't, but we can move other, I mean, the rest of the body that will impact the Achilles right. tendon and will, which will create fluids, will, will create load, not, in, not, not a lot, but just enough. Yeah. Well, it's the so right amount. A, yeah, the right amount. Yeah. That's, that's why we always call it the Goldilocks effect. And yeah, I love it. So, and over. of course, that's when we, when we did uh, ultrasound on him, that's when we saw that he could, he could really do some sprint work and he could step on the ice and start skating. Um, and it was just, when we saw the ultrasound, it, even the doctor, he said, like, this is, I never seen this, something like this before ever. This is, un, this is unreal. So yeah, he was a great client because he did everything we asked him to do. He took extra vitamin C, he took uh, collagen supplements. We, I mean, he, his, his nutrition, his diet was perfect. He slept, he did, he did everything. So yeah, he was great. Uh, and probably, of course, his genetics was perfect as well. Uh, so we had a lot of, he was a great client to do that, but it was it's still amazing. So right. but do you have like, so talk again about the system that, that I know you and I work, work with from the manual therapy standpoint that we go from we go from table to the floor table to the floor table to the floor a lot and sometimes we don't use hands at all we just do movement and sometimes we do most often we do both especially when it comes to injuries right mm -hmm. uh, so what's your like kind of practical examples when it comes to your system that you've been been working on well i built a system selfishly because i needed a system uh, when working with people, right? So it was built out of, as a project, it's obviously open-ended as research mounts, as research changes, as our understanding changes, um, then it becomes, you know, a much stronger system. Yeah. So it all starts off with number one fact, right? So this is not a Lennyism, this is just fact. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would we, love Leninism too. So. <laughs> I always tell people like the difference between facts and then my Leninisms, but yeah, the human organism is an yeah. open system. So what I urge, like we have three employees right now that are going off to DPT school. So they came in to watch all of us work, right? And now they're going up and they came up to me and they're like, you know, 
what's your advice? I say, well, before you start with all the books in September, this yeah. summer, what I want you to do is read a book on systems thinking. Yeah. So get the heck out of your career. Just move out of it. Yeah. Buy a book, go to Amazon, systems thinking. It'll completely change your perspective and it'll allow you to develop a framework that is real. Yeah. What I mean by real is gravity is real, right? Ground reaction force is real. These yeah. things we're not going to change. Our understanding of them and how it affects function may change, yeah. but the elements are the elements. Yeah. You see? So I said to myself, okay, with a systems thinking approach, how do you build a framework so that I can go in and work with anyone? Yeah. Anyone, not just yeah. the highest level of athlete. No. You should be able to work with anybody. Absolutely. You just have to tweak the variables for the individual. And that's how it all came about. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously it's very extensive, um, but it's based off of <clears throat> the unifying principle that we are an open system. Now, this is why this is important. There is no one best technique. No. <laughs> you may approach your hockey player different than I approach the hockey player. And we both could actually get great results. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm not a fan of number one, being in any one camp. Like I don't drink the Kool-Aid of this camp or that camp or that technique versus this technique. Yeah. I don't poo poo all that. No. What I say is what we've lacked is this understanding of systems. So everybody goes off and reductionistically thinks their stuff is the best. Yeah. When in reality, if you step back, humility and adaptability, you're like, wow, I can actually learn from everybody, exactly. but I can put it into my framework. So that's my ultimate where like, when I teach a class, I'm like, I don't want you to do it like me. I want you to do yeah. it like you. But what I'm gonna provide you is a thought process that, and you can follow this framework if you want, because it's very basic or you build your own, but it has to come from a unifying principle. So, you know, like everyone's got their principles, but the principles could be principles of physical therapy, strength, conditioning. No, no, no. I'm talking about unifying, which means it unifies every human. Yeah. Right. So unifying principles were an open system. So if you then go into a session and you're reductionistic, you lost me, right? Yeah. Because you're not following the unifying principle. Right. And so when you look at a system, it's kind of interesting. There's three parts of it. There's a purpose and a function. In other words, a context. Yeah. I want to be a better hockey player. Perfect. I, I have the purpose and the function as to why I'm here. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are elements. And then there's an interconnectedness. So, a, for example, a basketball team is a system. The elements are the players. The purpose is to win the game. Yeah. And it all has to flow, right? Each player has their role. Yep. Right? We got five guys on the court. We have a game tonight, right? They can't all be centers. No. <laughs> right? And it's interesting how when you look at this, right? And then the systems get bigger, right? Because I'm part of the system too. Yeah. Right? Because I'm going to go there today pregame and get guys ready for the game. So we have upper yeah. management, right? Yeah. So it's the same with the body. Yeah, so yeah. here's a question for you, right? And I'll, I'll give the answer, right? This is kind of a question for all of us. How do you make great athletes greater? Mm. Right? You go, they're already great. Yeah. How you make a great athlete greater is you focus on the elements that allow them to be great. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Instead of, you know, like, I'm not going to teach them basketball. No. I'm, I'm going to, I want to make sure the shoulder is functioning like a shoulder, the ankles function like an ankle and yeah. not just from a local capacity perspective, obviously from a global pattern capacity. Yeah. Perspective. yeah. And so it, it's really, it's really neat. Um, what you'll see with these experts and we have the unique opportunity. Um, it's as simple as this. We have two players worth, $200 million each, um, their contracts. Yeah. So if you own the team and you have a $200 million asset, you're going to put all resources into it. So oh, if we have yeah. an issue with say a low back, 
Yeah. Who is the best low back person in the world? They hire mm -hmm. them. And then who's yeah. the next? They hire mm -hmm. them. And then we get three opinions. Money's not the issue. No. Money is not the issue. It's, you know, put everything into uh, this player. But what I saw during this process is an extremely specialized reductionistic way of looking at the body. They only see yeah. it from their lens, yeah. right? They went through so much schooling and they have so much judgment based on their expertise or their specialty that they have just that lens on. If you mentioned yeah. to them fascia, for example, have you read the research on, you know, the density in fascia affecting mechanoreception, which is critical for human movement. 100%. Tissues can't function without input from the, the nervous system. No. So one of the things that, you know, when we're working, like I said, as a plumber, we're enhancing the fluidic function of, say, my anterior compartment, my thigh, the quad area. Yeah. That is actually helping the information go to the brain. So now the yeah. muscles and everything can work more efficiently. Yeah. They don't see it that way. They're like, nope, this is my specialty. Yeah. You know, and and so that's where... You know, I say, if there's one thing you want to do, just read a book on systems thinking, you'll be able to sift through and go, okay, that person's really good at that. I can use them now as part of my system. <clears throat> but if you're a practitioner, you know, it's really important uh, to realize this unifying principle, you know, and then with that said, um, that's my big anchor. I came up with scientific realities and this is important because I'm considered a hyper realist, right? I just, I want to study what's real. Yeah. You know, I challenge myself all the time. Like, what am I doing uh, yeah. in a treatment? What am I doing with this, this yeah. loading? You yeah. know, what am I doing? Uh, you know, doing a lunge matrix, like what am I doing? And, and that's, you know, it's an ongoing question, of course, but what I decided to do after falling in love with this quote, okay structure so the elements yeah without function which is the purpose right doing something so structure without function is a corpse and function without structure is a ghost in other words they're both important but if all you study is structure yeah and you don't understand function you don't have a holistic, if you want to call it that approach. It's the same mm -hmm. on the other end. I yeah. see people go the other end. They're like, oh, everything's functional. Just go run. You're our, yeah, yeah, just move. Yeah, just <laughs> do whatever. It doesn't always work that way, yeah. right? Yeah. You have to, and, and it's, it's going to be a constant puzzle all the time. Yeah. And so I said to myself, okay, structure is the potential capacities, the potential capacity. Yeah. Like say you go through my body, you do a DEXA scan, ultrasound, an MRI, and you're like, man, this kid's joints, everything looks great. That doesn't mean I can play hockey. No. I got the potential. It yeah. doesn't mean I can do it, right? No. So that's where function is real important. So I came up with like three what I believe to be scientific realities under structure and three what I believe to be very important under um, function, which is behavior. Function is behavior, by the way. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I anchor to, you know, when I'm making critical decisions, uh, when I'm coming up with techniques, when I take my own education, like when I go to learn something, when I read a book, they just came out, uh, this brand new book just came out, you know, just been yeah. a plethora of research, yeah. all the world leading experts, it just came out. Yeah. Um, this one came out six months ago in sport and movement. I mean, it's tons. And then you can go down all the rabbit holes because it's all referenced, right? Yeah. I want to read yeah. the paper now. You yeah. know, so how I sift through this stuff and papers that I read is through this framework. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow. For example, a month ago, I was listening to a podcast on a cardiac with a cardiac surgeon that did three heart transplants that were considered structurally successful. All three patients died within a 16 to 18 month period, but not because of the transplant because of congestion in the lymphatic system. So this led him yeah. to understanding, he's like, we don't have ways of measuring lymphatic flow. No. So everybody kind of dismisses it. It's kind of like fascia. Yeah, exactly. No origin insertion of fascia. It's all over the freaking place. Yeah. I've dissected fresh, fresh tissues. And it's like yeah. a dissection, which is very different than 
um, treated tissue. Yeah, untreated absolutely. tissue is like an autopsy. Yeah. And as soon as the air hits it, it changes. And so again, it, it's like, wow, the lymphatic system, which is the fluid system, how important it is. And this book, so I bought his book after listening to his podcast, I bought his book and it's like totally outside of our field, yeah. but yet it integrates into the framework. Right. And it and helps. So important, yeah. Like, what am I doing? Like, what are you doing when you say, yeah. Hey, I get guys moving real quick. Like, what are you really doing? Right. Exactly. Guys squeeze his ankle. You're like, I stand him up and I put him in water. Well, guess what you're yeah. doing? Yeah. You're affecting the lymphatic system because what do you want with That's an injury? It. You That's want it. groceries in and what do you want out? Garbage. Garbage. Yeah. Exactly. You want garbage out, groceries in, right? Absolutely. That means it has to flush. It has yeah. to move, right? Yeah. And Dr. Robert Schleich talks about mm -hmm. this. It's so great. He's like, you know, and first of all, when I say water, just to be clear, water inside the body is different than water outside the body. So people say, oh, I got to drink more water. It, no, it's not oh, yeah. that simple. No. Um, don't get me wrong. I want you to drink water. I want you to drink water, but water Absolutely. in the body because it mixes with proteins and that's what makes it a, a viscous element yeah. is different. Yeah. But he says like, when we put pressure, let's say I have some achiness in my thigh. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but the number one injury in the NBA, a lot of people wouldn't guess this number one injury. I guess right when it comes to shoulders. Contusions. And really? you're like, oh, what's the big deal? Oh, it's a huge deal. Thigh yeah. contusions can lead to patellofemoral problems. We've seen it over and over again uh, mm -hmm. because of the adaptation. I mean, they get some big contusions. I mean, this yeah. is like MMA sometimes. They get neat in the thigh. Whew, it, it's big. If you explain contusions for those who don't understand that. A bruise. Like, yeah, yeah, just yeah. science word for bruise. A exactly. Big, bad bruise, right? Yeah. And it damages the tissue. And we can actually see it in the ultrasound. Yeah. And there's a new, uh, there's some new technology out there. This is fascinating. Your listeners might, especially if you have athletes that listen, it's called Springbok. And what it is basically is they take it, a normal MRI image and they run it through a computer program and it goes through your whole body and they spin the body around. It can actually look at the volumetric elements. In other words, how big your muscles are. Um, and it shows contusions. It shows scar tissue. Oh, it's fascinating. Absolutely wow. fascinating. Um, we were overly we're impressed for because they took one of our players and they put them through it and they didn't know the player's history. And then they were educating us on what they're seeing. And we know the player really well. And yeah, it's quite fascinating. So we're starting to do that with a lot of our guys um, just because it gives us really good data on how to train and condition them. Yeah. So what, what do you, when you talk about that, like talking about I mean, of course, there's, I mean, listeners now are like, okay, there's, there's, this is, there's just a lot. There's a lot we're talking about. Yeah, there's a the lymphatic system. There's the collagen system. There's the proteins and there's fluids and it's the hyaluronic acids. And it's so many things that affect human movement. Mm -hmm. But we can't exclude anything, right? But what, what do you say about, like, I know Tom Myers too, he talks a lot about emotions affects our how we move and how, how we like injuries and everything. What do you say about that? Like we, you're talking about, yeah, we have this 200 million guy and he knows he's a two million, 200 million guy. He knows the GM is, is looking at him every game. And, and I mean, pretty much demands him to, to earn his money. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we have the fans and then they have the critics and we have the, the media. Um, and of course his own, um, I mean, he, he wants to be obviously show everybody that he is worth 200 million. Right. So that has to put a lot of stress uh, and a lot of, a, a lot of, a lot of stress to his body. And sometimes it's not going to go really well. And sometimes it's going to just fly and he's going to have a, he's going to be in the zone, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a lot of emotions involved at all times, I guess. So what do you say? Like, especially like all walks of life, like, not top athletes like what well, because i see a lot of stressed people wherever we go like people are so stressed right. um and well, i guess if you if you want to have like a, a really functioning body i guess stress and how you feel mentally it's going to be a big a huge part of it right or what right. Do you say? well okay so there's two things i'll say to that and for those who are listening that are practitioners this would be a good one to write down and challenge yourself. There's two words you write down. 
impose and expose. Okay, impose, expose. Next time you're with your athletes, your clients, ask yourself, how much of the session did I impose versus expose? It'll blow your mind. It'll humble you really fast. Like yeah. I go into the session thinking that I know more than they're telling me. In other words, I'm a shitty listener. Yeah. The other way I'll say this, somebody said this to me and it really changed you know, there's certain tipping points in your life that kind of change your trajectory. This 100%. was one of them. Lenny, do you know the golden rule? I said, yeah, my grandmother taught me the golden rule. What is it? Do to others the way that you want done to you. He goes, yeah. well, that's really selfish. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because that's imposing, right? Yeah. He goes, try the platinum rule. I go, what's that? Do to others the way they want done to them. Yeah. Love it. So to answer your question... I'm going to listen and I'm going to try to expose as much as possible. And that's what formulates what I'm going to do in this framework I already discussed. I have a framework. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what makes what we do so exciting because no one session is going to be the same. No. And in my opinion, this is just a lineism. I think what we do for a living is going to be more popular in the future because of the isolation that we see people yeah. working from home um you know just covid did this to us big time yeah. and there's a lack of like lack of touch a lack of caring yeah um you know think about yourself like you just say you're just sitting around and someone just takes with a nice flat broad hand just puts it on your back and looks you in the eye and listens it's like it, yeah. it, it means something of course, yeah. Right, and they've done these studies, right? They take babies away from the mom. There's no nurturing growing up, and the behavioralisms that come out of that versus somebody that's very nurtured. Yeah. You know. Um, so yeah, what you said is is very important. I think sense what a yeah. person is sensing. Yeah. Trumps everything. Yeah. What we say is so critical too. We're, you know, and that's one thing. Like I learned in pro sports is you're working with some of the best athletes in the world. Um, I never talk negative. Like I was thinking about a guy today when I went in this morning and I'm like, I wonder if they're helping him with his left hip because his left hip lacks workspace relative to his right yeah. it's, it's you versus you, right? His right hip space workspace is amazing. His left is not. Yeah. I would never say that to him. No, of course. Now he asked, he goes, Hey, do you feel a difference between my left and the right? I'm like, you know, your tissue quality is great. Uh, we could use a little bit more capacity on the left. And yeah. I go, but we're all like that. We all adapt certain ways and that's what we'll work on. That's what's going to make you greater. How do you yeah. make, you're already great. How do we make you greater though? We give you more capacity mm -hmm. to do what you do well. Yeah. That's really, I, I look at that. That's my job is I build capacities. Because exactly. if I can get an athlete to have a high level capacity, they're going to go off and do what they already do. And yeah. that's why, you know, I do like to see LeBron James do what he did. Like last night, he scored 56 points at his age, given his <laughs> training age, too. If you think about his yeah. training age, he yeah. plays yeah. more than anyone deep in the postseason, which is like yeah. extra years, right? With the amount he has played. But to see his resiliency, um, yeah. because I always yeah. said, you know, when you say, oh, I'm old at 32 in pro sports, I think a lot of it has to do with what you said earlier is just the lack of understanding hygiene. Yeah. You know, and it, it, that always pissed me off too. I never went to the dentist and they say, Hey, you know what? Come see me every six months. And if your teeth really hurt, no problem. We'll just give you new ones. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, the dentist does a great job evaluating, sends me to a hygienist that they do a great job. And then they tell yeah. me how to brush and floss on my own. So when yeah. I come back, it's not a horrible appointment, right? Where they yeah. got to dig in deep and give me Novocaine and, you know, all that. So yeah. I'm like, well, you know, why don't we do that with every part of the body? You know, yeah. why don't we get people hip hygiene and back hygiene? And, you know, we do. Um, that's a, that's a big thing. But I think, again, it comes, it comes down to priorities, right? Like, as we talked about like in the beginning, too, like people are so obese and people get getting bigger and bigger and more and more unhealthy. It's, it's a priority. People chose, they choose to be like this. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to change to be 
and I guess too, like that's why there's so very few that can actually become pro athletes because you need to do stuff that no one, no one else is ready to do. And one of the, those things is to take care of your hygiene or your tissues every day and make sure you, you create that resilience in your body as so you can. I mean, elite sports are not healthy for anyone. It's, it's so bad for, for a human body. Oh yeah. yeah. You, you have no confuse, choice. Yeah. Right? People confuse, um, high level athletes with health. Um, they look very healthy. It doesn't mean that they are healthy. No, um, some of them are, I, I'll give credit to, I know quite a few that have really worked hard on their nutrition and yeah. Um, but it is a, you know, pro sports is a grueling physical activity. Absolutely. Uh, and it, it takes a toll on the body. Yeah. And I think too, like what you were talking about with sense and, and emotions and stuff like, I feel like the more I listen, the more the client or patient or athlete or whatever you want to call them, the more they're going to open up. It's going to be easier to work with them. But I think number one thing is they pretty much always knows the answer to their problems. If you yeah. just listen. To them. If you listen, yeah. If you yeah. listen. Instead yep. of doing like, I'm, a, I'm the back pain specialist here you're gonna we're gonna do this and you have back pain okay i can solve it i'm just gonna do this right and they don't listen and they're never gonna get any better in their back um uh, maybe if, if the real authority maybe you will believe him and you will be manipulated in, in in a little while but that pain will come back to you but i think um i think it's really interesting just to listen to their story especially if, they, if there's someone that had pain over a long period of time Mm -hmm. and they like they explain like their whole body like it started here and then i have this and this and i think it is this i'm like i think you're spot on yeah just by listening and the reaction they get when they just get listened to it's amazing because no one's no one has been listening to them ever pretty right. much and i think that's the most common thing I, i've noticed over maybe the last six seven years right it, our, our feel are we're so bad at listening to our, the people we meet and the people we really want to help. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this comes down to, as you said in the beginning, like humility and be able to like sit down and listen and say, okay, now we can start. I've been sending people home like, oh, you're so good at this. Can you give me a treat? And I'm like, dude, first of all, how are you? Yeah. Because you're, I, I can see that you're, you're not really well, right? I mean, and they start talking and sometimes they start crying right away. Like they really opens up and like, if they come to me really stressed and maybe feel like crap. And I mean, their whole body is just so tense. Do I want to put my hands on them and create even more stress on them? Right. I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. Right. I agree. I think, yeah. So I guess it's, uh, we, I mean, as we said before, we, we started to record this, that we can talk about this for hours and hours and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so uh, let's try to wrap it up a little bit. What, anything else you, you want to share that you feel like, cause I think like we talked about, I wanted to like get people to, to understand that this, what we're doing in, in, I mean, Sweden is a small country and a lot of, a lot of people knows what I'm doing and just to hear from someone like you here in that really works with a high level athlete but also been working with like what we call like the average joe or all walks of life like everyone uh and i think that i agree 100 percent because i spent my first like 10 years in, in working i worked like i don't know 10 hours a day with anyone i could train anyone i could help and I didn't care if, if they were 82 or, or 15, I'm like, but I learned so much from that time, I think. So uh, is there anything you want to like expand on um, just to wrap everything up? This has been a uh, lot of information. <laughs> yeah, no, I would, just, yeah, I would just conclude. I always like to be as practical as possible. And, you know, when we listen to podcasts, I know I listen to podcasts too. You're trying to take something away. And I think I'll reiterate what I said before. There's a plethora of information. There's a lot of information out there, especially in social media, some good, some, you know, just, you know, people are just throwing stuff out there. 
if you really address the human organism as a system, an open system, because there's a difference between a closed system and an open system. Yeah. And you learn a little bit. It might take you one to two hours. Just study a little bit on systems thinking. It'll really help you, I think, filter out the difference between need to know and nice to know. Yeah. You know, and, and help your career. Yeah. Uh, and that's even like I have athletes that ask me that, you know, they like to read. And I'm like, yeah, just yeah. first read a systems thinking approach. And that'll allow you to hire the doctor as opposed to just sitting there listening to the authoritarians. Like I was never big on that. I was never big on just listening to authoritarians. Um, I mean, I will listen and, and gather information, but they're not going to you know this is what you have. You know, that happened to me early on. They looked at my back MRI when I was young and they're like, oh, you got to fuse it. And I'm like, why do I have to fuse it? Like I started asking <laughs> questions. Yeah. Then the whole conversation shifted to, yeah, maybe you shouldn't. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, 10 minutes ago, you just told me you wanted to operate on me. Now you're saying not like, and I'm like, you got to ask questions. And I think you got to ask the right questions. And the way you do that is learn a little bit about systems thinking. Yeah. Uh, there's another book out there too. measure what matters. And again, this is getting out of your career and going off and seeing how FedEx is so successful and all these other big companies, Google, yeah. Yeah. Um, measure what matters. Because, for example, when you're working one on one with somebody or even in a team setting, um, are we measuring the right things? Are we just testing a mm -hmm. test, as Gary Gray would say, or are we mm -hmm. actually testing the individual? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And that's important. There's a there's a quote that I have in one of my slides. It's not so much the injury that captures our attention it's through injury that normal function is laid bare there's a famous neurologist that said that in other words they come in because their back their knee their ankle but if you said hey if i have a magic wand and i was to take your ankle discomfort away yeah. take your knee discomfort away what would you do uh i'm gonna play hockey oh so it's <laughs> hockey that you want and that's what you miss or yeah. I want to do this with my wife, or I want to go for a walk with my dog. Yeah. That's really the focus. Yeah. You know, and that's what I mean by you have to be context driven. And so yeah. that book, Measure What Matters, um, that was really good. That, that helped me kind of organize uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So that's how I, I, agree. Read. I, read, I, I read it too. I love it. And, and uh, so let's, let's do one for, um, everyone that's listening that are not working in our field and are not athletes, you say taking care of, of your tissues or like your tissue hygiene. Um, mm -hmm. So if you compare that to brushing your teeth every day, you take a shower every day, what can like an average um, person do every day to take care of their posh or their tissue, their connected tissue? Well, I think, so um, yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, yeah depending on you know what kind of resources you want to put into it. I think one of the best investments I made is an infrared sauna. Yeah. Um, and then in the infrared sauna, like you do, you roll your foot. I have a little you know, device that I roll the bottom of my foot. Mm -hmm. um, the bottom of the foot, as you know, is, is such an important aspect of human function. Yep. You see people falling over the age of 60. A lot of it has to do with the reflexive um, capacity of the foot because the only yeah. way we know gravity when we're standing is our feet yeah right and what happens with shoes is they dampen the receptors over time that's the first thing by the way that goes on a human body is the sensory part okay that's and that's important right so like when you're foam rolling there's way more to foam rolling from a sensory perspective than there is you know, rolling out a dense piece of connective tissue, which you, you can't yeah. change anyway. Yeah. No. Um, and that's like we talked about earlier. People, I oh, can't stretch the IT band. You, you're correct. No. You can't. And if you do, no. you tore it. Yeah. Um, but we can have an immense effect on the nervous system and yeah. the fluid system. So fluid system. rolling. But what I would say with rolling is you go extremely slow. 
right? So you can jump in water like, oh, there's a pool right there. I'm going to go jump in. Great. No problem. But if I got on the roof yeah. and I went to jump in the water, it acts like cement. So the faster yeah. you move in fluid, the more resistance there is. Yeah. Now, there are techniques where you can roll faster if you want to try to excite the system. I'm, I get that. But if you really yeah. want to help the fluidic environment, and it really helped to hydrate your tissues mm. about an inch per minute. That's very, yeah. very slow. So it should be yeah, like, like this foam. Yeah. Instead of foam rolling, it's like foam holding, right? Yeah. You yeah. hold on the area. Um, and then we, you know, we teach people to do some active movements when you're holding uh, points of the tissue statically. Uh, the vibration guns, same thing. Just don't go real fast. They're great too. Uh, yeah. today I was standing up and I had one and I was moving my body around standing yeah. with the vibration gun. Those are great. And holding to one spot. Uh, and hyper ice, they've done such an amazing job because their specialty is the recovery space, right? The hygiene. Yeah. And I've talked to them about this whole hygiene concept, um, and all their devices, you know, they have a Norma tech and they're becoming more and more affordable. I would really not going out on a limb here, I would say within the next three, four years, you're going to see these things very affordable, yeah. not just pro sports, you know? Yeah. I mean, right now the massage guns are affordable. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I mean, all these things are great. Like the, the massage you, gun, like say, can, can, can you buy any massage gun? That's, that's a little like a common question I get too. Um, Cause some are really cheap and some in like high price is obviously very much more expensive. Yeah. But, do you think you can buy anyone or is this? Uh, you're going to get they... what you pay for. Yeah, you're going to yeah. get what you pay for. Any kind of mechanical device is going to have wear. You know, it's just part of the physics. Uh, yeah. They're not going to last forever. The thing yeah. about Hyperice is you have a an extremely solid company. So if something goes bad, they'll replace it. Yeah. If I just go on social media and it's, you know, this massage gun from uh, a knot, you know, well reputable company, then the chances are if it breaks or it comes in the mail and it's no good, you're not getting your money back. No. So for me, I'm going to go and I'm going to order something where I know that yeah, there's a brick and mortar. You know what I mean? Like they have yeah, a real, yeah. it's a real business. Yeah. Um, another thing that I just learned too is they, they actually have a Samsung motor inside. Um, so their technology is, is definitely uh, superior from what we've seen. And I've, I've been dealing with massage guns now and, you know, it really it's a vibration percussion yeah. unit uh, for about over 20 years. I had the original, it was called the deep muscle stem. Yeah. Um, I've seen the evolution of these things over, you know, the last 20 something years. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what you do. Like you can do that every day. It's a roller, use different kinds of balls all under your feet, do the massage gun, do the rollers, but do it really slow. Um, mm -hmm. To do this every day, like you do it in the mornings, you do it before you, you're gonna run or you're gonna do your hobby or sport or or yeah. when when is the best time to do it? Do you think? You know, at the rule of thumb is any one position that you're in. I don't care what position you're in for over ten to fifteen minutes is gonna start to create fluidic yeah. changes in the body that can be, you know, um, that could affect the body, you know, in a negative way. So. Yeah you know, do it when you can. Um, I like to talk to each individual and say, you know, what's your life like? Because sometimes in the morning, people are rushed. Yeah, you know, so I don't want to put extra burden on people. Mark. You can do it as, as often as you like. I know what I do personally is I'll have like, the vibration device in my living room, I'll have these tools available. So I see it. So if I'm going to watch something on TV, or I'm going to watch a game at home. And why, why don't I make it more productive? Yep. Norman Tech's great like that. Too. You sit and watch something. Yeah. Um, so you said Norma Tech a few times now. Uh, I don't think we explained what it is. So you explain it like fast. Yeah. It, think of a blood pressure cuff, only it goes, I mean, they have them for all body parts, but a lot of people use them for their legs. Yeah. And it's like a big blood pressure cuff that goes on your legs and it just creates a nice pumping action like this. So you're, you know, just relaxing. Yeah. And this is basically pumping pumping yeah. the fluids yeah that's great well um as always great talking to you and you know i love to talk to you about this and we've been talking to each other a lot over the years and we need to celebrate it's been 10 years dude we need to celebrate yes. we need to meet up yes. um, you gotta make it to so los thank angeles thank you so much for what's that 
You got to make it to Los Angeles like last time. I, I have no problem going to Los Angeles. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to surf. Yes. I'm going to surf with Lenny. Yeah, let's do it. No, really, thank you so much for taking the time. I think people will really appreciate this. And um, I hope I'll see you really soon, man. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.